Good afternoon, everyone. It's now noon. Uh, I'm Garrett Turberg, the APA Nevada Southern Section Director, welcoming you to our first event of the 2021 uh, year covering master planning and live work in Southern Nevada. So just a few housekeeping items, and I will put one of them on the screen for you right now. Uh, first, this session will be recorded for posterity. So uh, please make sure all microphones are turned off. I hear one kind of open right now. Okay. Um, if you haven't yet done so as an AICP member and want to log the 1.5 CM credits for this session, please email me at the following address, and that should be on your screen, the gtb at clarkcountynv.gov. Uh, with your name and APA number so that we can compile a list to send on to the national uh, organization for their to confirm that you are supposed to be here. Next, uh, please put your questions in the chat area and we'll be monitoring that to uh, ask the speakers uh, those questions. So because of that, uh, due to Marco's tight schedule, there will be a short Q&A after his presentation, he's up first, and then there will be a joint Q&A at the end for Brady and my presentations. And now please take a look at the information on the screen uh, from our sponsor, our treasurer. Our first speaker is Marco Bellotta with the city of Las Vegas regarding the CLV uh, 2050 master plan. Uh, after he has finished, we will have Brady Bernhardt with Clark County to talk about live work opportunities, um, not only in, here in Southern Nevada, but around the nation and beyond. Uh, finally, I'll be wrapping up with the Transform Clark County Initiative, County Initiative. Comprehensive yes. Master Plan and Development Code Rewrites. So if there are no uh, other uh, comments, uh, let's go ahead and get, let's uh, get uh, Marco started here. Go ahead, Marco, you've got the floor. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Marco Vallada. I'm with the city of Las Vegas. And today I'm going to provide a, a general presentation about master plans and master planning itself, just what they cover, what, how they come into effect, and essentially some, some information on two, process, on two plans that are currently happening. Um, the City of Las Vegas 2050 Master Plan, um, and then we'll hand that the, uh, the Transform Clark County uh, presentation over to uh, Garrett. So we'll jump right in here. Um, the authority to plan and zone is really rooted in uh, state statute and in the Nevada Constitution. Uh, we have different articles of the Nevada Constitution that really empowers and enables local governments to plan and zone land. Uh, that is delegated down through uh, special acts of the, uh, of the legislature itself through our city charters or through general law under NRS 268 or through um, other, other portions of, of NRS that deal specifically with, uh, with counties and other local governments. And, and it's from there that language um, is, gives the, the city councils or the local governing bodies the authority to develop, prepare plans for future growth and development. NRS 278, of course, is really where you find the meat of the master planning uh, statutory requirements. The preparation and adoption of master plans really is rooted with the planning commission itself, which is a little bit different from how some other states do it around the country. The preparation portion of, uh, of the plan um, does get delegated down to, uh, to city and county staff um, itself to actually prepare it. But it, at the end of the day, the, the adoption is going to be through the, through the planning commission and then on to the governing body itself. Some other statutes um, uh, really deal with some of the, the form and contents of the plan itself and how it coordinates with other local governments across uh, an entire region. In NRS 278-200, it's really broad in general as to what the, 
what the plan consists of. It can be uh, any number of, uh, of documents, uh, maps, uh, policies, procedures, uh, things like that that are that are really captured uh, in terms of what uh, what a plan can consist of, and and that broadness allows for uh, local governments to tailor them to their specific needs. However, in NRS 278-160, there are certain required elements, and this can vary a little bit based on the size of a county or a city. Um, but in general, the, the core elements include conservation, historic preservation, housing, land use, public facilities, safety, transportation, uh, parks and open space, and then most recently added is urban agriculture. Now, this has been a, a, a really condensed list. In 2011, the, there, there were actually additional elements that were required, but some of these were consolidated, ironically, through a bill that uh, the city of Las Vegas sponsored. Um, so there are sub components and sub requirements that are embedded in each one of these uh, elements. For example, under conservation, um, there's, there's some requirements with respect to a solid waste management plan. Uh, for transportation, that's encompassing of not only streets and highways, but also transit, even though most local governments are not transit providers, and though that's done through a regional transportation commission. Um, and then things like economics or population, those are, uh, those are combined under, under other, other elements here. So they really do have uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of subject matter that can be covered. And, and because they're comprehensive in nature, they can, um, they can also address things that are not specifically enumerated. There is a, there is a uh, subsection under uh, NRS 278-160 that allows for just about anything to be covered that's not within the, new, the enumerated list. As far as a master plan goes, in terms of its adoption, there's there is a requirement for regional conformance. And in Northern Nevada, it works a little bit differently in which a master plan is reviewed um, by uh, the regional planning organizations up there, either Truckee Meadows or Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. In Southern Nevada, we have Southern Nevada Regional Planning Coalition that does have a requirement uh, for the review of master plans at a five-year interval. Um, and that's really looking for uh, conformance with the adopted uh, comprehensive regional policy plan, in our case, Southern Nevada Strong, um, in which they're uh, to make a determination of conformance. So any master plan that, get, that ends up going through an adoption process or any amendment thereto of a master plan, it goes to SNRPC or in the Northern Nevada jurisdictions, uh, goes goes through those regional bodies uh, for a for a review to make sure that they're uh, they're conforming. Now there there are a few other uh, exceptions here and there uh, in some of the smaller counties, but um, more or less this is in the spirit of making sure that local governments are again working together to make sure that they're uh, achieving the you know uh, common goals. As mentioned, the adoption process is through the planning commission and then immediately after that uh, through the governing body. There are steps in order to get to those po points, uh, including notifications and doing a neighborhood meeting, um, pretty much providing a lot, of, uh, a lot of general information to the public about what the plan, uh, the plan that to be adopted does and what the effect of, uh, of the action by the local government is going to be. In terms of implementation, there are some other statutory requirements um, that go along with uh, uh, the planning uh, process itself. Um, and again, this is the, the, the routine putting the plan into effect language. Um, there's the promotion of plans and recommendations for implementation. This is a requirement in which uh, the Planning Commission provides information to the, the governing body itself as to what it sees as best to to be done to implement the, the plan uh, as adopted. And that can happen on a, on a routine cycle, a routine interval uh, to again, make sure that the plan's goals, policies, objectives are all being made. Another common implementation action is through zoning itself. Uh, and most 
and that's mostly tied up with uh, the land use element, land use components uh, uh, that's required in the master plan. Um, and that uh, has its own set of uh, procedures in, uh, in which local governments, uh, again, are enabled as through the constitution, through city charters, through other general law, uh, to regulate land and put in the specific requirements with respect to use, uh, dimensions, height, bulk, uh, setback, things to that effect. So that's a really broad overview of, of uh, the statutory authority for, for planning itself. Just to give a, a little bit of a preview for this session, it's probably not that likely that, um, that we hear all the build draft requests that are out there uh, this session just because of what's going on in Carson City with respect to the budget. Um, there's uh, about 1,100 bill draft requests right now. Um, but that being said, you never know what, what the Assembly or Senate end up uh, picking up on. There are two, though, that kind of relate to master plans. One, which we don't have a bill from the, um, from the Legislative Council Bureau just yet, but it, gov it deals with governing urban planning and public health. And then another that uh, that's, uh, revises provisions for zoning districts. There was one um, uh, that was just, uh, that, that is actually now a, uh, uh, a Senate bill um, that has to do with uh, NRS 278A and for local governments that have done uh, planned unit developments. Uh, so that has, been, uh, that has been issued so far. Um, but those are the main ones to maybe watch out for here in case, uh, uh, in case they do get picked up and meet legislative deadlines. So now to shift over to the uh, to a case study uh, first with me, and then we'll um, after I conclude and take a few questions, we'll go over to Garrett for Transform Clark County. Um, the city of Las Vegas has been working on a new master plan for the last two years. And really the, the need for this was because it's been a long time since we have done a major update to the master plan, at least since 2013, when we had a last uh, uh, update of a, an individual element. Uh, but the, the 2020 master plan um, was adopted in 2000 and 2020 just came and went. So there was uh, definitely a determination that everything in the master plan uh, for 2020 was met. Uh, and there was direction that was given from our city council to, uh, to develop a new master plan. We retained Smith Group, uh, team of sub consultants to assist us with, uh, with developing the plan itself uh, in doing a, a public outreach campaign that, um, that had a little bit of a, an overlap and spillover into the, the pandemic, but still we were able to get a lot of uh, good public engagement prior to prior to the, the, the pandemic on what um, the people, people in Las Vegas wanted and saw as a priority for the future. Smith Group helped us develop a, a vision and guiding principles for the plan uh, and, and really listen to what the commission and city council wanted in the, next, uh, the next 30 years. We did some an, initial projections and, and again, in line with a lot of what we had uh, determined in, in uh, uh, our initial research, uh, a lot of things kind of kind of align really well. If if we're continuing our population growth that had been going on throughout the 2000s, 2010s, even with the Great Recession, we stand to add at least 300,000 new residents within the city of Las Vegas itself, which is only a share of the entire regional population that is projected to grow uh, throughout Southern Nevada. Um, doing the things with, that we recommend within the master plan would require that we need at least 100,000 new housing units within the city. Uh, and then all the uh, additional uh, services that and infrastructure that go along with it. So, so new schools, new teachers, uh, new employees, new uh, police officers, new parks. Uh, would all come with that. Um, and this plan will help us uh, get, to, get to that place. During community outreach, we did uh, a wide range of, of things we, you know, that were really traditional. And I think we kind of miss now since we've adapted so much to, uh, to doing things virtually. 
Uh, but we did get out to the community as much as we could uh, and did community stakeholder events uh, throughout the city. We also did some surveys through uh, applied analysis uh, as well as through the city of Las Vegas uh, in which we got um, a, a good deal of information from the, from the public about um, what they felt was important. Uh, and not surprisingly, education, homelessness, uh, the drought, open space preservation, public safety, those were the ones that really came to the top. Not, not that that was the end of the list. I mean, it, it really did cross uh, a wide spectrum of issues. I mean, healthcare definitely became much more of a concern uh, uh, later on. And we, we definitely heard a lot of people voicing concern about that. Also remember, you know, some of the things that were going on, uh, you know, in the uh, in the middle of last year, we did hear, you know, new new issues that rose to the surface, uh, especially in response to COVID-19 uh, and some of the, uh, you know, some of the things that were going on across the country in Washington, D.C., in Minneapolis, uh, and many other cities um, with respect to uh, um, uh, uh, equity and, and um, uh, George Floyd. We had a... Um, Based on that, we developed a vision for change, and and really we we seek out uh, what Las Vegas in the future was is going to be like, and and this vision statement really and captures that. It also provides us a glimpse of what those guiding principles are that were are reflected in each of the goals throughout the master plan. That the city of Las Vegas will be equitable. That it will be resilient, it will be healthy, it will be a livable community, and we'll do things that are uh, that are innovative. Um, all of these together um, are the foundation of our uh, strategies for, for addressing those challenges throughout all of the required elements and subject matter of the master plan. So where we are now, uh, I'm, I will provide a little bit of a preview as to what uh, it is, but it, you can take a look at uh, the plan uh, as, as it's been drafted at masterplan.vegas. Um, we did hold a, a, some planning commission workshops in, in September and November of, of last year uh, after doing a, a round of revisions. We did get um, thousands of comments from the public during the, uh, during the time we had uh, uh, it out for revisions um, and we incorporated as much as we could uh, into the plan um, as, a, as a result of that. So again, it, the plan does provide this, uh, these guidelines for future development uh, really aligned with what uh, NRS requires uh, and really what in response to what the, the community told us. Uh, we, we did it in a way in which it was in which it's implementation oriented. Um, so these recommendations are adaptable to change, but uh, we're able to at least um, provide, provide council and the planning commission direction for how we grow and develop. The plan has five chapters, uh, land use and, uh, and the environment contains um, new, new sections on areas of the city uh, the environment and land use itself, including new general plan uh, place types and uh, our plan for future growth and development, as well as chapters on economy and education, systems and services, and uh, implementation. A unique feature of this plan is that we have new planning areas, and these were developed uh, using Census, guide, census boundaries and uh, common boundaries that you find throughout the city. Um, it really, the idea behind this is to uh, help us create a sense of place for different parts of, of town and then where necessary, do some deeper dives uh, with the community over the next couple of years to get into some specific detail as to what, what the community really wants really to get into some finer grain detail. And we've done a, a lot of this already with respect, with downtown Las Vegas, as an example. Downtown, you know, we've already adopted a special area plan that has a form-based zoning code that's specific to that, uh, to that area and its own set of uh, really tailored implementation strategies that um, really are focused on infill and redevelopment 
because that is a unique part of town. And while places like Summerlin North, Summerlin West are covered under a development agreement or uh, you know, Providence, Sky Canyon uh, within the Cow Canyon and LaMadre Foothills areas have some of their own standards. Uh, we might not necessarily need to go to that fine grain detail, but in the inner core of the city, like East Las Vegas or Charleston, uh, Twin Lakes, we'll have an opportunity to, to really kind of fine tune things uh, with the community and uh, really work with, uh, with them on things that are of uh, import to them. So overall, each of these areas, we wanna make sure that they tie back to those guiding principles uh, and and really capture all of the all the things that the community responded to us on um, what they really uh, uh, what they really cared about um, and and again the plan helps uh, provide that uh, direction to them and a good feature of it is that we are able to track progress over time uh, you, for each of these uh, for each of these areas to see how well they perform to illustrate a little bit. Um, this is East Las Vegas. This is a recommended uh, land use plan for it, and really, it, it shows uh, you know we're focusing it. We're focusing on making land use changes along major transit corridors that either will be built in the future or already have some really good at transit ridership now, including Eastern Avenue and Charleston Boulevard uh, on the uh, bottom and on the uh, on the uh, left side, and then Nellis Boulevard on the right side. That goes hand in hand with what RTC has done um, with respect to high capacity transit. Uh, those are two, you know, those are three identified transit corridors where there's there's projected to be some form of high capacity transit in the future. And each area is set up in a similar way. Again, we can see what some of the key metrics are for for each of them, um, with you know, with respect to uh, the jobs housing balance, how many. Uh, parks are needed, uh, what travel times are, what water usage is. A lot of socioeconomic and demographic um, information is, co is contained within each area and we're able, we'll be able to make comparisons across the entire city as well as uh, focus in on what needs to really be uh, changed for, for, these, uh, for these areas um, for the better. The overall plan for land use is, is again, tying it directly to those transit corridors. We expect to see less change within neighborhoods themselves, but there might be those, those instances in which we have recommendations for, um, you know, for adjustments to Title 19 or zoning code. Um, either way, we'll identify those in, in those future sub area plans uh, and, take, uh, and take a closer look. Right now, we're we're just doing an update on the general plan uh, coming up here with respect to adoption, but what will come next is the, the zoning changes that go along with this. Uh, we will have a new, uh, a new section of our zoning code that will align directly with some of these new, these new place types um, for, uh, for the future. And as you can see here, I mean, again, most of that land use change is, is along those major corridors, uh, the, the arterials, uh, Sahara, Decatur, Charleston, Eastern, Nellis, Rancho. And, and again, a lot of this is also building, building off of Southern Nevada Strong, linking regional centers together wherever they are in, in the community, whether it's downtown North Las Vegas, Nellis Air Force Base, the Las Vegas Strip, uh, with downtown Centennial Hills, it's tying everything together so people can get around and lit and have a diversity of, of choices on um, where they live and how how they live and how they get around things to that effect. So the new uh, the new place types that we have with respect to future land use are aligned with transit oriented development. Uh, so so the new categories that really focus in on different levels of intensity. Uh, and, and again, the focus on, on the regional centers in which we've already done a lot of work on is to really build up those areas. Uh, and we have form, uh, a form-based code that deals specifically with downtown Las Vegas. Um, but those, those corridors themselves and the, the nodes at, at, in, at intersections along those corridors, that's where you, 
will have the potential for transit oriented development to occur either as a as a development you know quarter half mile uh, around it or um, uh, linearly along the corridor itself again to make these walkable uh, livable neighbors neighborhoods uh, and then tie to the the areas that are immediately around them um, and this is uh, this is the general plan map uh, for the future, and, and this is tying everything together. We we haven't made any changes to our our other general plan categories. Um, you know, there's a lot of complexity that goes into it uh, when you combine, you know, areas like Summerlin and uh, uh, with with areas like uh, the East Las Vegas and and what and uh, the areas immediately around downtown. Um, so those more or less are still in effect, but there is that opportunity to make uh, make some corresponding zoning changes. But as you can see, this ties this this ties together with the uh, with the transit oriented development that goes along um, the major arterials. Uh, and again, because there's a there's a tie in with zoning, we will um, we will have some change that goes along with this that uh, that will allow for these new zoning types to be used within, um, within each of the new general plan, future plan categories. With respect to the rest of the plan, I mean, all, all the other goals are set up in a similar fashion. We have a different subject uh, that, that are tied to each of those NRS required elements. And as you can see here for urban forestry, as an example, we have a goal and then how the goal ties to the guiding principles of equity, resilience, health, livability. We have our, de our desired outcomes for the future. So in this case, um, plant planting and maintaining uh, 60,000 Mojave, uh, Mojave Desert's uh, native and adaptive species, uh, increasing our tree canopy coverage, um, making sure that the city's population is uh, close to green infrastructure. To get to those outcomes, we have key actions um, in which we have implementation strategies that get us to those desired outcomes at whatever point in the future. And each of these goals are set up and like that. We have uh, analysis, a presentation of what the challenges and opportunities are. Uh, and, and again, I encourage everyone to take a look at it on masterplan.vegas. So with respect to implementation, um, we are looking to make sure to make sure that we have each of these uh, each of these different issues covered in some way. Um, we are we, we do have a setup in which we'll have uh, internal departments able to work on specific uh, specific old areas because this is not the planning department's plan. This is the city of Las Vegas plan. So it, it does go across individual departments itself. Um, there's a number of different ways we can we can uh, put the plan into effect, uh, adoption of policies, uh, capital improvement projects, and then working with community stakeholders like the county, Southern Nevada Water Authority, RTC. In some areas, we might not be able to do some of the things that we want to do. So there are some recommended legislative changes as well, things that, that can make things easier for the city to implement the plan and get to those desired outcomes in the future. We also look to putting this plan online and making it really usable and adaptable for, uh, for the future. Um, we have what's called 50 by 50, and they, those are the 50 top outcomes that we're looking to achieve over the next 30 years. Um, each of these uh, each of these outcomes are are in, in different goal areas, but ultimately we want to provide information on how uh, on how the plan is doing and provide that information back up to the planning commission and city council again in the spirit of what NRS requires, and and hopefully we can do this uh, online on a on a dashboard that's uh, accessible to the community and understandable. So our our next steps. Um, we are going to continue working on uh, on different on different parts of the plan. Uh, one one thing that really came to the surface was our park system plan. We're doing that simultaneously with the Parks and Recreation Department, which is also seeking accreditation through CAPRA. That's the Parks and Rec uh, certification uh, that that's uh, issued nationwide. 
Um, so that is going to be happening at this at the same time, and and it is an implementation strategy of this plan. We're as mentioned, we're going to continue working on conforming zoning uh, for those new place types in some form of a of a an ordinance that's um, that's aligned with the future land uses, and we're going to be uh, taking components of other planning it, uh, initiatives. Uh, in, in one case. Uh, that, that's notable is the Maryland Parkway TOD plan, in which we're working with the county to develop a specific uh, a specific corridor plan, and and again align it with what we you know what we're doing on the on the 2050 plan and the form based code for downtown Las Vegas um, along the entire corridor between uh, the medical district and the airport. Um, so those are things that are going to be happening uh, simultaneously. Coming up in um, a couple weeks here, we have some neighborhood meetings um, and feel free to attend if you would like. Um, we have them on, we're gonna be having them on March 16th, 20th and 22nd um, in person at City Hall for those that, uh, that need to uh, jo join uh, locally, uh, as well as online at, uh, uh, through WebEx, uh, through Facebook and live stream and on KCLV channel two. Um, details and information for it are on the web link below, uh, lasvegasnevada.gov slash neighborhood meetings. Um, and uh, the first half of the meeting will cover, again, a lot of the information that I just presented, followed by some specific input on uh, the park system plan. Assuming all goes well, um, we're looking at adoption at, by the Planning Commission on April 13th and then through the City Council on May 19th. Uh, and then what comes after that will be uh, getting those zoning uh, text amendment through for the uh, uh, for the conforming zoning and then doing uh, any any rezonings that are necessary for uh, uh, conformance with, uh, with the general plan. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, I will take some questions if anybody has any uh, any questions and uh, I will try to uh, I will try to answer before we turn things over to Garrett. Okay, thank you, Marco. And I just wanted to mention there in the chat there, so far we've just had one comment from Scott Carey at the State Lands uh, Department. Uh, please take note of that. Uh, he has some good information for you to, to look at there and, uh, uh, and kudos to Marco, of course, on, on this presentation. So actually, instead of me going next, we're going to let Brady going to give him a little break in the action here. I like to call this the sandwich. He's the meat of the of the of the session. We're the on the outside kind of putting it together for him. So anyway, uh, Brady, if you're ready, we'll let you uh, step in. Uh, what, is there any other is there any questions right now that anybody has that wants to put them in for Marco because he will have to leave. Yeah. Well, I guess we're good for now then, Marco. Maybe uh, they could always uh, email questions to you. We'll put your email address on at the end so they could uh, do that. All right. So, um, okay. So we'll go ahead and let Brady go next. Thanks, Marco. Good. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my name is Brady Bernhardt. I work with Clark County as a senior planner. And today I want to talk about work live, zero commute, mixed uses, live work, and some of the distinctions in between the uh, and the definitions of those. <clears throat> One of the reasons I wanted to do this, so I was curious, you know, where has this type of uh, living arrangement, work arrangement gone over the last 15, 20 years? especially in the Las Vegas uh, area. Started off by uh, wanting to recognize this commercial corridor redevelopment strategy, but it's a recent uh, PAS publication from APA, PAS report 598. And it, it's, uh, it does support the live work, mixed use, work live, zero commute uh, principles that, that I want to touch on today. These are just a couple of uh, interesting quotes from it. <clears throat> uh, I think it'd be useful to go over some of the differences of what these are. So really we're talking about mixed uses 
and uh, a subset of mixed use development. And so I'm gonna start big and go small. So large uh, examples of this, be large scale mixed uses. They tend to be over five acres in size, roughly, give or take. Uh, they tend to have more than three floors associated with them. Uh, and they also sometimes are characterized by having separated uses. They're not all in the same building. So we see that uh, quite a bit with larger developments. Uh, you'll see an apartment building in one part of the property, uh, retail and office perhaps on another part, uh, and then they call it mixed use. Other examples are more obvious mixed use where they're actually all in the same building and more condensed and uh, compact. And then you move down to uh, work live situations and you'll see some examples here in a minute on my slides where the primary goal is to work and the secondary uh, is to live. And you'll find that uh, quite often these things are defined as being required to have studios, lofts, or one bedroom apartments, not uh, multiple bedroom apartments. And whether or not that's uh, directly uh, attributable to trying to keep families out of these areas, that's another issue. <clears throat> so that's work live where the work is primary, uh, living is secondary. Then you have live work situations where living there is the primary goal, working is perhaps a secondary. And this ties into home occupation uses. This is a good example of a, a traditional live work in our day and age, uh, where you live there in your house and you do a business on the side. And that's usually just one person in most cases. You have the zero commute uh, uh, example. Zero commute example is really employee based. And when you have an employee based example, it's centered on the employees. And those seem to be pretty rare to find. Uh, they're not as easy to find examples. And I'll show uh, later how that works. Large scale standalone, uh, we'll start off with that. And here in town, we have the, uh, the jewel uh, condominiums. This is down in Bonneville. You can see the retail's at the base, of the first level. And in this situation, they've got a second floor that's. Uh, available for the work situation. And then condominiums above. You can see that it's a dense, you know, it's a compact development, uh, concentrated and uh, not so much corridor related. And I'm glad that Marco uh, talked about high capacity transit corridors because later on we can discuss the importance of, of considering live work arrangements in those corridors. This is an aerial view of the jewel. You can see how compact that it is. It's in an urban area, obviously. Another view. Okay, now we're moving into the live work, uh, work live realm. <laughs> and this is a property over on Sylvester Lane that uh, is primarily industrial factoring. It's owned MD in Clark County. And there's an area of view of that. Now, you should be able to tell from this picture that it's really kind of off the beaten path. Uh, it's a standalone development that's not on a major corridor. Uh, yet, I, I'm told by the commercial brokers that it's a, it's a pretty successful development. Another view, obviously it has a much more modern industrial look to it. The lower levels being the, uh, the workspaces primarily. This is Loft Works over on Tanea. This is built in 2008 and it's fully occupied. Uh, phase two is going to happen at some point in the future, they say. They hope. Uh, this is an example of another uh, situation where you have a manufactured MD zone, manufacturing zone. Uh, possible light industrial manufacturing uses on the lower level and then residential uses above. This is a street view. And an aerial view again, uh, this is off of Sunset and Tanea and 
although it's not really associated with a primary corridor, um, it's again a standalone uh, site. This one's interesting. This is over uh, Buffalo, uh, north of Lake Mead, and <clears throat> it's inspired by ovation. It's an apartment complex, which you can't see. It's off to the right, several hundred units. But what I took photos of uh, were the apartments that are also above a uh, small scale commercial right off of uh, Buffalo and the units that uh, you can actually lease as a renter of one of the apartments. And uh, this property would be a good example of a primary live property. You're living there in apartments, but you also have the opportunity to uh, rent a space for commercial use. Just the aerial view. Uh, I guess uh, that area of Buffalo is not what I would consider a real commercial corridor, but uh, those buildings on the left hand side of the image are the buildings with commercial, and then the remainder is apartments. That was built in 2017, by the way. So, this is an excerpt from our Clark County zoning regulations, and it's the manager's unit uh, section. A variety of ways to handle uh, these live work arrangements and codes. This example uh, is pretty flexible when you read through it. It does, it does point to mixed uses uh, and square footage limitations, things like that. <clears throat> but it's one way to um, get the word out that, hey, this stuff is available in our in, in codes, and you can actually approach it uh, as an option, in, especially in transit corridor areas. So one of the things I've determined is that I have not been able to find a lot of good examples of transit corridors that have a lot of the work arrangements uh, already built. Quite often, what you'll find is standalone, uh, larger developments, more compact, downtown oriented, which is great. Uh, but we're not seeing uh, this type of living arrangement branch out into the smaller scale uses. And that's something that you know we may want to consider as, a, as, as planners and as uh, folks out in the community you know, in the future, especially while we're doing these master plan processes. These are just a few items that I wanted to uh, throw out there and see if anyone had any interest in talking about them. Um, the decreased parking needs related to increased online and internet sales, that's just a basic commentary on how the you know, retail world is. A lot more uh, online purchases, possibly leading to less parking requirements, uh, you know, maybe needing to revisit the parking requirements that, that we, we have that might be older. That date back prior to the online sales becoming, you know, sky high. Efficient uses of space in and around new commercial developments. I've noticed this. Um, we don't often see the most efficient use of space, and this touches on sustainability. Uh, so that's something we should think about as we move forward with these type of proposals. Zero commute living. Um, it's a it's a great concept, especially when it's worker oriented, employee oriented. Employee housing. Uh, in areas that have abundant housing, it may not be as popular, but as we heard from Marco, our population is going to go nowhere but up, and we're going to have these issues you know, come up in the next 30 years, more so than they have. <clears throat> On site eyes uh, for security, you know, my, it's my, my theory that if you have people living above stores in commercial areas, that they'll be safer. Uh, it's debatable, <laughs> but when you look at crime maps, where are the hot where are the hot spots, the nodes that are high crime areas? Inevitably, they're commercial corners, commercial centers. Usually, uh, I mean, and you know that's debatable, but it's something I wanted to throw out. Continued use uh, operating uh, option during vacancies. This is just something for the owners to consider. Hey, you know, if you're building a commercial building and you can do it the right way and have uh, living arrangements on top as a second floor, for example, and you can do it the correct way, make it work, uh, why not? Uh, 
got you've got that going for you in addition. Now, there's a lot of economic impacts that we could get into and spend a lot of time talking about, but I won't. <laughs> so I'll bring it up. Utilizing the uh, main entrances and secondary entrances. Uh, this is something that gets back to the design of the site, efficient use of space, uh, encouraging mass transit. This is something that, you know, I'm glad Marco talked about that uh, in detail because this is something that could really tie into these types of uses more so than we've seen, especially along corridors. Encouraging pedestrians, uh, bicycle activities, things like that. Again, in the right places, the right, you know, areas that could work. And then I, at the end uh, here, I just have NIMBY and NIMBY, but I also have one called NIMBY, which is, so NIMBY is not my backyard. NIMBY is yes in my backyard. And NIMBY is maybe in my backyard. So, you know, we've got all these classifications, but I don't know where this falls yet, honestly, uh, because I have not been involved in the process to, uh, to propose one of these corridor oriented uh, live work environments near another residential area to see what the response would be. So I'd be very curious to know if anyone's had that experience, um, whether nearby residential opposed it for some reason, or maybe they supported it for some reason. And the discussion about high capacity corridors as well. So good. Now I tried to find some examples of small scale uh, developments along transit corridors or just commercial corridors in general. And this is an example in uh, Solana Beach, California. It's a very high rent area right near the beach. Um, so I recognize that, but, you know, and then and of course the architecture is different than we're used to. We, we don't do as much brick usually. But it's an example of, uh, you know, just popping up one more level uh, and having commercial down below. And this is in San Francisco, obviously, uh, you know, just another example of a large apartment or condo complex in the back with the uh, strip center being uh, in front. Out the front. I'm gonna go back because I think these buildings right here could be useful examples. Uh, maybe not, you know, three or four levels, but possibly just imagine this with a two, with a second story on it. And those commercial uses underneath being those things you typically associate with corridor uses, um, I think it could work. And it just depends on where the location is, obviously, and if they have enough space. But these things could work in corridor settings and provide additional housing. And they would add up. Because when you look at all the acreage that's being used along corridors for commercial, you add all of that up with second story housing that works in certain places. And those units will start piling up and start making an impact, especially for uh, worker housing that's you know needed lower lower income worker housing. Now, when I say lower income, a lot of the examples you see in these pictures are not low income housing. Uh, they're quite the opposite. They're they're not cheap. Uh, so that's something that needs to be discussed. And I think I'm going to end my presentation so Eric has some time. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Brady, for that great presentation. Um, and we uh, uh, will continue on now getting the uh, second part of uh, master planning going here. And let me get to uh, sharing my screen now with you. And here we go. And let's see, that should come right up. And uh, looks like I'm on. Everybody agrees you see it? We're good? Okay. Let me, um, let me actually uh, do it to the full, full screen here. There we go. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> you know, we've heard from um, Marco talking about the master planning in the city of Las Vegas. Heard from Brady talking about, uh, you know, one aspect of that process that we're both trying to get to, which is live, work, work, live, and whatever other combinations we want to get to with that, uh, is there, um, we're, from there, we want to go to a, even a, another kind of process, which is where we not only do master planning, but we also want to do the development code all in one, uh, 
one shot. So uh, this is a little bit more unique uh, across the country. Uh, most of the time, it's either one or the other that uh, a jurisdiction will do. So in this case, we want to try to get it all in one uh, one place, uh, get them to be integrated, and uh, make it make it work. So uh, this is in, and I will say at this point, we're we're just starting the second year of a three-year process because you know this is extended with all the things we're working on with it. Uh, but so far, it's been great. I think uh, you know I want to say. Uh, We've had the opportunity to work with a, a wonderful consultant that's uh, you know been really supportive and useful uh, with us. Uh, it's the Clarion Group out of Denver, and uh, they've been great to work with. So we, uh, you know, I want to give them kudos for that. And you know, of course, we're, we have more to go, but we're we're well into the process. Uh, so you know, as the city of Las Vegas is winding down their process, we're you know, like I say, we're we're building on ours now to get it to a little bit, uh, you know, uh, move it on and farther in the process. So with that, uh, let's move on uh, to the next slide. And that's just gonna nuts and bolts of what we do in our meetings. You know, you've probably seen all that before. So we won't talk about that much. Uh, this is what I wanna get into though, is our timeline right now. So, okay, as, as Marco mentioned, uh, they were able to do a lot of their public participation pre-COVID. Uh, we did not, <laughs> we, had, we were full on into the, the COVID season, I call it here. Uh, and so with that, uh, everything's been virtual as opposed to you know, face to face meetings. Uh, I'm hoping as we get you know, a little farther along later this year uh, and into next year that we'll have be able to go back to having those face to face meetings. So that's my hope that we'll get there. But with that being said, uh, we're now on looks like a step four of an eight step process. So uh, back in the early um, <clears throat> uh, 2020, uh, we did, uh, you know, looked at orientate an orientation of where we want to go with this thing. Uh, then the second step was look at, you know, what's, where are we at with the county? And, and we need to find out and get a baseline going. Uh, then we went to looking at doing some vision and goals, uh, working on them. Uh, we have now moved from that uh, or continue with that, but move from that more into the, uh, looking at policy uh, and code uh, co combinations and how they can you know, work together. So this is really, we're, like I say, we're really getting into the, the heart of this thing right now where we can see how they, they both work together you know, in, in a great fashion. So then from here, now we're, we're getting started uh, into the draft of the master plan. Uh, so that's gonna be work going on uh, the first part of this year. Uh, then we're, you know, as we get later in the year, um, you know, these dates, you know, as we know, sometimes slide a little bit, but uh, the idea is to get uh, the master plan adopted and uh, start to look at implementation of that uh, before the end of the year. So that's where we're at uh, looking to go with that. Uh, but in the process of doing that, again, the code is in there. We're, we're mixing them, the, the processes together so that we can actually have the draft of the code, development code uh, early next year. And then, you know, basically kind of following the same process that we're doing with the, the plan right now, but doing it with the code in 2022. So that, that tells you, gives you an idea of where we're headed. All right, so, so what have we had so far to date? You know, Marco mentioned, you know, several thousand uh, in, people inputting. We've had uh, nearly 4,000 so far doing online surveys, which is pretty, I think it's pretty impressive that that many people will go online and do a survey, uh, you know, in these times. So uh, I think part of this is, again, uh, people are getting more used to the online environment. So we're uh, able to take advantage of that. And uh, it's really been a good thing to have here. So with that, uh, you know, here's the, the bullets. We have internal and external stakeholders have been involved. Uh, so, and then we've had interviews and meetings with the, the county staff and officials. So, uh, you know, internally, we've uh, tried to get uh, really what, what we're looking for doing uh, on, uh, on this level as well. And then uh, of course, getting with the elected and appointed officials and getting updates uh, you know, both to them and from them of what they see us doing. So with that, uh, again, we had some virtual open houses. Uh, we've had some virtual town board meetings uh, with uh, with those folks, and then uh, again the online surveys. So it's been, a, I think, a really good mix so far of the of the input we've been uh, able to get. Okay, so then we want to talk about the master plan, the framework that we've uh, put together here. So uh, with that, <clears throat> and we're putting flesh now on the bones. Uh, started with our core values. There are six of them. You know, City of Las Vegas had five, and we're going to do six which I'm gonna go through in a little more detail in a little bit here. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, getting those core values, we wanna put on, you know, hang on those, the goals and policies that would go with each of them. 
Uh, again, the goals, we're supposed to have specific targets and objectives we need to work toward together uh, to maintain those core values. And then the policies that give the direction for those values. So moving down, down, farther down the, the line there with those uh, on those levels. Uh, then uh, we want to talk about, uh, you know, going then from there, we're, and we're in the midst of doing this now, we're looking at specific planning areas, and we have 11 of them. Uh, so it's, it's a little more challenging because each area has its own unique uh, set of uh, criteria and um, uh, characteristics that we need to address. So that's what we'll, we need to work on with that, or we are working on that, in, in, in fact. And then again, as we get into the summer this year, we're going to get into how to do some of this implementation of these uh, uh, goals, policies, and, and so on, uh, as opposed and, and part of the values, of course. All right, so that's the actions we want to see happen. And we're going to work on that as we're coming through the year. All right, so here are the six core values. Uh, the first one talks about unique communities, neighborhoods, and lifestyles. We're going to break this, uh, we unpack it here in a minute, but uh, that's uh, you know talking about where we live and how we live. Uh, second one, having equitable access to programs, services, and amenities. Uh, very important, and uh, we see some really uh, great opportunities in that area. Uh, third value is uh, having a healthy and sustainable natural and built environment. So that gets us into our different, um, uh, you know, our, our environment and how we uh, how we uh, interact with it, uh, both the natural and the built. And uh, then core value four, more connected Clark County, you know, also known as, you know, mobility, transportation and all that uh, typically comes under that core value. Uh, value five is talking about a diverse and resilient economy. And uh, boy, haven't we had that over the last year or so, trying to figure out how we're going to be more resilient in the midst of these kind of unexpected uh, changes that have come about in our lives. And then the, fi the final value here talks about having a sustainable and resilient growth and development. So taking that then to the next level, how do we grow in the midst of stay be still being sustainable and resilient? So that's a, that's a, that's a challenge for us. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's look at core value one in a little more detail. So again, this is talking about where we live. Uh, and so with that involved, we wanna increase our diversity of housing options. We wanna have more affordable housing. Uh, we want to be able to um, you know, have more distinctions uh, in the different parts of our county. You know, We have the rural, the suburban and urban, we have it all in Clark County. Uh, and again, most of you all realize, I mean, land our area, our county is the size of New Jersey. So it's it's nothing to sneeze at as far as the th way we have to provide services across a large area. So that's that's been a challenge over the years and, and we're, we're meeting it and we wanna continue to do that and even surpass that. Uh, then the next uh, bullet talks about caring for established neighborhoods. Uh, in, in one of those things is, you know, there are those neighborhoods that have historic value. We want to, uh, and character, we want to be able to uh, accentuate that and uh, give uh, uh, credit for, you know, what they, what, they are, what they are and what they do and how they're part of the, the fabric of our community. <clears throat> and then uh, next would be uh, having unique considerations for outlying communities. And again, these, these outlying communities are, each one has its own unique character. So you can't characterize them all under one umbrella necessarily. You have to break them out and look at them one by one. And then uh, the last bullet here talks about preservation of cultural, archeological and historic resources. I already mentioned that a little bit about historic neighborhoods, but uh, you know we also have other resources besides uh, that. So from that, with that being said, um, you know these are the things we heard about in, in this core value. Uh, looking for more uh, support for the broad concepts, and then uh, you know how do we deal with the details as uh, underneath those. Uh, there's also a continued focus for residential neighborhood preservation areas, and we do have several of those uh, in in our uh, both in the urban and the uh, rural areas. Uh, more in the urban areas, actually, though we we have those uh, uh, identified, and then we also have a desire for stronger focus on outlying communities. So we really want to. Uh, pay more attention to them and make sure that we're uh, you know, not losing sight of their needs along the way. Okay, core value two, let's talk about that now. So talking about the services that we provide uh, and in, in the last present or the presentation that Marco talked about, that they have an emphasis on parks, we do too. Uh, parks, trails and open space, actually, we want to really uh, ramp that up, you know, as far as, uh, you know, how do we actually make that work as we go forward uh, over the next 30 years, we're in the 30 year window, just like city of Las Vegas. 
And in fact, I've already had some discussions with Marco about how do we look for ways to collaborate along the way among jurisdictions, uh, to, you know, share common, uh, you know, services and, and so on. I mean, there's some of that uh, opportunity in there and we're gonna see if we can find some uh, further. Okay, next is uh, maintaining the array of recreational, uh, educational, enrichment, and special interest programs. So, you know, those are really important at Clark County. We really want to uh, we want to make sure we're providing those kind of services for our, our residents and visitors as well. Uh, then uh, provision of high quality, wide reaching health and social services. So again, we're, we, we found out this past year that health and social services you know, are really areas that we need to uh, focus on further. Again, things we didn't really think we'd ever have to deal with. We're dealing with it now. So we've, a lot, and the great thing is a lot of our uh, people have, have done a great pivot and made it, make it work. Uh, and it's just been great to see that happen. Um, you know, of course, UMC is one of our um, uh, agencies, uh, sub agencies within the county. And we, uh, you know, we look to them to, to be a leader in, in the health area, along with the other uh, 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 hospitals and so on in the valley and beyond. So, and, and then of course, social services, that's critical. I mean, the people's mental health and, and so on is really important that we wanna to continue to look to that as well. Uh, and then family services, et cetera. And the last bullet here talks about creating opportunities and spaces for local arts and culture. So um, we wanna take a, take a look at that and see where those opportunities may uh, arise and how we can make sense of that. Uh, in case, and then in the box, what have we heard about this? This is core value. Uh, we want equitable distribution of programs and amenities. We want parks, trails, and open, or these people want parks, trails, and open space that are strength and, and, and be connected. Uh, connectivity is, I think, a really big one that we have uh, continuing to well look at. And then again, the last one, talk about the emphasis for arts and cultural facilities. All right, so there's core value two. Let's keep moving, core value three. Uh, healthy and sustainable natural and built environment. So, of course, we want to have better air quality. Obviously, the Las Vegas Valley has had its history of um, not so good air quality at times. Uh, we want to continue to see that uh, get, uh, you know, addressed and worked on. Uh, next, uh, reducing quantity of landfill waste. Of course, we want to have more recycling, uh, have things that uh, don't have to go in that, that land, those landfills. Uh, and then, uh, you know, sustainability and resilience uh, into our built environment. Uh, there is, uh, you know, the lead uh, uh, building the codes that uh, I think are really great to use. And there's some other things we can do to uh, enhance those as well with our built environment. Uh, expand availability of clean energy and reduce the, uh, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, of course. Yeah, we don't want that. We want to have clean energy, uh, improve our, air, our water quality and enhance our conservation. So a water quality, of course, is critical for us because we basically have only one source for the most part is Lake Mead, you know, and we don't want to put in there what we're going to take back out and have it be a problem for us. So we want to make sure that's uh, addressed. And then again, you know, our conservation programs, uh, making sure that uh, there's less turf. And on a personal note, I'm getting rid of the, whatever little bit of turf I have left in my yard. So I would in, uh, encourage everyone out there to do the same and uh, make sure that we're conserving our, um, conserving that water. That we need. And then the final one here talks about our public lands. And yes, we have a lot of public lands in Nevada, don't we? It's a high percentage up in the 80s to 90% uh, of, of our state is public lands. And how do we deal with that? How do we interact with it? Again, there's those interfaces that we have to uh, be uh, aware of and how do we uh, make that work for us? All right, so back to what we heard, uh, addressing sustainability as well as the natural environment, uh, placing a stronger focus on climate action, and then finally integrate water supply considerations. So those are all important. All right, we have three more to go, so let's keep moving. All right, now, okay, uh, the more connected Clark County, again, this gets into uh, multimodal transportation options. So we want to expand those, um, you know, getting people out of their cars, that's really, a big deal, you know, that we can get the, the transit uh, opportunities working for us and the, uh, you know, other uh, walking, biking, all those things that continue to see that uh, increase. Uh, and again, yeah, the next bullet does say that. And, and coverage, uh, cover our transit system, make it more efficient, more uh, uh, logical to use and easy to use. Uh, convenience, really important. Uh, next, uh, roadway efficiency is important to pursue the traffic calming in areas. We've started doing that in some of our 
uh, parts of the county, and we want to see that uh, you know continue. Uh, then uh, next is coordination among the plans and collaboration among the service providers. Yes, we want to do that. Other agencies, other jurisdictions, we want to be able to uh, good collaborating partners with them. Uh, and then we have we talk about transparent and efficient government with meaningful opportunities for citizen engagement and participation. Absolutely, we have to have that. Uh, you know, we can't operate in a vacuum here. We need our citizens to uh, let us know what they want and how we can help them get that uh, whenever we can. So what we've heard, transportation must address roads and auto travel too. Uh, residents favorite transit improvements, so they wanna see that happen. And then again, interagency collaboration is central. Yes, absolutely has to happen. All right, core value five. Diverse and resilient economy, what do we wanna have? We want the, uh, the economic development strategy to expand our economic base. Uh, there's opportunities here for a lot of, uh, you know, diversity of our economy. Uh, we'd like, you know, uh, yes, we have, we've um, uh, depended on one particular sector for many years, and we just can't do that all the time. We can't expect that to continue forever. Uh, yes, we'll have it as a component, but we don't, uh, we can't just, you know, put our full uh, weight there and get uh, the results we may want to get as time goes on. So we need to look for that uh, diversity. Uh, next, tailor our education and training to prepare for a skilled workforce. Yes, our education system needs to uh, really step up and make sure that we're getting the people we need here in Southern Nevada or you know statewide to meet those challenges. So we want to be able to see people uh, grow up here, be educated here, and stay here to, for their careers. So that's that's a a concept that we want to continue to, to pursue. Uh, next, yes, support the existing small businesses. They are the backbone of our economy. Uh, I mean, yeah, we got the big, the big players out there, but you got to have the, the mom and pops. You got to have them there to make this thing, you know, a complete picture. Uh, they're a, a, a significant sector to to, uh, to keep and keep healthy. Um, and it's been a challenge. Like I said, during COVID, a lot of small businesses have not made it or have been very severely uh, hampered by, you know, what they, they could do or couldn't do. So we need to see that revived. Uh, next, we want adequate technology and land for these businesses. Uh, that is a challenge for us. We have a finite amount of land in the Las Vegas Valley, and there is a you know there's pressures here for areas that uh, would be more suited for employment that have become residential, and we don't want to just see that uh, all of that good employment land uh, go away and, and not have it available when it needs to be used for that purpose. And then uh, finally, um, we have um, economic considerations uh, for those outlying communities. Again, keep them in the mix and really make sure they're, they come along with us. Okay, what we heard is we need economic diversification. Yes, absolutely. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, more focus on aviation and military. Yes, we wanna make sure we're supporting them and protecting their, um, their uh, mission and what they do. Um, you know, the different uh, facilities we have in the county, uh, we wanna keep them uh, vibrant and strong. Uh, next, important to keep pace with evolving technology and infrastructure, absolutely. And we want to make sure that we're not losing track of that. All right, last one. Let's talk about sustainable and resilient growth and development. So with that, uh, what are the policies? Uh, we want to coordinate growth with capacity. So what does that mean? <laughs> Again, we have a finite amount of, of uh, property, land. Uh, we will have to grow up rather than out. We don't have the luxury of just saying we can just spread everywhere, nor would we want to actually. We want to have more of a um, uh, compact, as, uh, as Brady was talking about, compact developments that uh, serve several purposes. That mixed use is really, I think, uh, is a key to uh, seeing things work as we go forward. Uh, then uh, we want to accommodate varying densities of, um, of residential. Uh, that's important uh, for, for, for the resilient growth and development of the area. Uh, we want to expand uh, transit-oriented development. Yes, exactly. So we can make the, that connection between, again, that live, work, and also move <laughs> around the, the valley, right from where you live and work, if that, uh, that's the way to go. Uh, development quality, yes, we want to increase our development quality. Uh, there's um, 
opportunities there. I'll, I'll just leave it at that for some real in, improvement in our development quality, and we want to see that happen. Uh, next, disaster response planning and mitigation. Right, we had that. I mean, we had to make that turn, you know, come up on a year, was it two weeks from now, right around uh, the middle of March. That's when this all kind of came down on us uh, as far as when we realized it was going to be more than just a passing thing. It's uh, been with us now for that, that one year coming up here. So we want to continue to work on how can we uh, move our way out of that into recovery as fast as we can, uh, and yet safely, of course. And then finally, um, we want responsive emergency services. Uh, yes, we have um, those emergency services are key to making sure that we we, we are able to get that, uh, that the recovery we're looking for and make it work. So last, <clears throat> the last, uh, what have we heard? Uh, predictability is important, but we should aim higher. We, we need to um, be more creative, I guess, from the way we look at all these situations. Uh, next, balance our concern for the affordability with higher quality. So, yeah, you know, you know yes, I think such as affordable housing are important, but we want them to be, you know, not more than just adequate. We want them to be special if we can. And then finally, increase focus on resilience and sustainability of growth. And again, that's that's key. So anyway, these are the core values. And we're in the process of, you know, like I say, putting flesh on the bones and getting them to the, down to the lower levels in the weeds to where we're actually gonna go ahead and uh, uh, do the implementation of these things. All right, so this is the planning area considerations. Those 11 areas we talked about, what would they be? Okay, so here's a map of the 11 areas. Notice we have uh, some white areas in the middle. Those are the cities, you know, within, within Clark County. Uh, but notice the great amount of uh, color area, uh, areas that have color to them. And then, you know, that's those 11 areas. So how do we deal with them? So first of all, we don't want repetition between plans because they're unique. Each one has its own unique needs. Uh, we want the easier. We want to make the plans easier to update and administer. Uh, historically, we found you know this this is a big process that goes into each one of those eleven areas, and it, it's just very can be very burdensome, and it doesn't have to be. I think we can streamline it a lot. So that's where we're we're headed with it, and then we want to clarify this process for the future. All right. So within that, we have adopted plans and we are going to have some area specific input as part of these surveys that we're taking right now. And there's the areas all listed on that chart. Uh, the, <clears throat> the countywide goals are gonna be interweaved into that. So with that being said, how we, what we wanna do is focus more on the what and less on the how of how we do this. Um, what are we gonna do? That's, that's the key. And then we want to shift regulatory language to the development code. So yes, for we will say for many years, our land use plans have been called pre-zoning and we don't want that. We want planning to be planning, zoning to be zoning, uh, not that they're totally separate, but yet they work together, but uh, we want to have more of the regulatory part in the zoning or the development code. So that's, that's where we're headed with this whole effort. Uh, then they have the different land use plans. Uh, we want to go to a single set of land use categories that have been all over the map, uh, literally, for years, and we want to have them more consistent there, uh, making more general. Uh, we want graphics and photos to, uh, to uh, convey our intent. So much as you saw with the City of Las Vegas plan, they had a lot of graphics, images, and so on. We're going to be doing that now, which we haven't had in the past, and doing that more with our uh, plan and code together. They'll, they'll look and feel very similar. So that they can, you can move from one to the other with a lot, a lot of uh, uh, problems. And then the maps will be updated to align with these categories. And of course, we review them for consistency and so on. All right, and we want to. The key here is, is not to have these um, mega changes going on each time we do updates, but hopefully the, the number of changes will be uh, um, uh, marginalized or minimalized from what they used to be. A lot, a lot less. And then how we align these two, as I've been already alluding to. So here's the, here's how they work together. So we have the advisory part of the plan, the regulatory part of the development code, and then the advisory plan um, informs the code about what it is the code should be doing. So I like to say that the, um, you know, if I, I, I do the um, illustration of the, the car, okay, if you have an automobile, the uh, master plan is more like the body and the the main part of the, the car that can get that get down the road, but you got to get down the road. The way you do that is through the code, which is like the engine that makes it work. So 
they, they have to work together as one uh, uh, common um, inter interaction of each uh, part to make it work. So here's some themes for the code rewrite, which we, again, we just started doing that, the code part now. Uh, we want it to be more user-friendly. Um, we realize one size does not fit all in the, in the code. Uh, we want to reduce re reliance on waivers and non-conforming zone changes. So this is our challenge. We want this, uh, <clears throat> the zone changes to be more conforming zone changes, uh, hopefully a very high percentage that would be that. And then, uh, you know, talking about the PUDs, the planned unit developments. Uh, again, Marco talked a little bit about that in his presentation. Uh, have a little bit of more flexibility in that option. So that's uh, something I think that will make them more usable in, 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 as we go forward. Uh, then we want to improve the efficiency of our procedures. That's, yeah, that's important. Uh, we want to modernize our uses and broaden our zoning districts so they're more usable and uh, user friendly as you get into the processes uh, as the developers want to. Uh, make a, uh, make an impact on our, our community uh, in a positive way, of course. Uh, raising the bar for development quality, and there we go, with that development quality again. And then remove regulatory barriers to infill, redevelopment, and adaptive. This is, and I think this is an area that really is is an opportunity for us. Um, we've we've tried at different times uh, over the years to have uh, different um, redevelopment um, areas um, with mixed success. We want to see that uh, you know improve as we go forward too. All right, so we're ready for next steps. What would they be after we get through these, this this monumentous effort that we're going through? So this is a timeline going forward. Right now, we're in the middle of uh, working on these area specific pro uh, policies. Uh, we're consolidating the land use categories and their maps. Uh, we're targeting the zoning district assessments, and then we want to do a code assessment to to see what can we can keep and what needs to go. In, in the code. Okay, and then uh, going moving into uh, around April, uh, next month or so, uh, we'll be having more of these uh, community and stakeholder meetings about the master plan and zoning district recommendations. And then we get into May, we have some development code assessment meetings. So again, moving a little more quickly now into the, the development code. Uh, and I will tell you, typically, people are more interested in the code than they are in the plan, but uh, we're hoping that this will become a a little more balanced approach now where people will see, oh, the, the plan and the code are actually, they can work together. It would be good to have that. So we want that. We don't want the plan to just sit on the shelf. You've heard that uh, expression many times, I'm sure. Uh, we want to see it used. And then, uh, you know, then we go into uh, further uh, things on the plan. Um, we have the area specific policies. We have the consolidated land use categories uh, coming up here. Uh, we're targeting zoning district assessment, code assessment, uh, then the, again, the, the meetings, and this, this is very similar. Both both processes are, are, like I said, they're kind of dovetailing each other. And then, uh, you know, as we get into July, we want to have more more meetings about the draft master plan. As we have the draft ready to to review now, we'll be able to let the, the people see that a little more further. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, this is where you go to find the uh, the key to all of this. It's transformclarkcounty.com. So uh, go there often because uh, things change on there. We have a different uh, uh, pieces and parts that uh, they're put up there, get input, and then they bring those to the side and other new ones are, are put in their place. So, uh, you know, don't, don't just think it's a static uh, website. We're, we're, it's pretty vibrant up there. So please take advantage of it and check it out. And so with that, we're, I guess, in, into the question discussion about both our presentations. Let me take a quick look at the chat to see if we have anything there. Let me, uh, first, let me get out of here. Okay, stop sharing. All right, there we go. And let's see, any, any chat? Nothing yet. Okay, so any anything you wanna put in there, now is your opportunity to uh, give us some uh, questions. Um. <laughs> okay, we have to have a funny question in here. Why does Jared Tasco hate puppies? I don't know. Is there anybody that has an answer for that one? <laughs> okay, we'll leave that one for another time, I guess. How about some other questions? We wanna give you the opportunity here to do that. And let me put up that other, um, the public uh, service announcement here while I'm at it. Let's see if I can do that, there it is again. Yeah, there it is, okay. 
this is our emails uh, addresses are at the bottom as well. So you're uh, so you can contact any of the three of us with your needs or your uh, questions if you don't have them at the moment. And Garrett, again, you do have a question in the chat. Oh, you do. Okay, I'm, I didn't see it. Okay, let's see. Let me go look again. Let me get back to that. Here we go. Okay, the chat is. Hang on. Okay, chat. Okay, here we go. Okay, so okay, here it is from Krishna. It says, oh, there's a couple of them here. Okay, Scott said, um, how do you think the Hyperloop Las Vegas project is going to impact land uses within the Las Vegas Valley? Okay, very good question because obviously it's uh, it's going to be a game changer. Uh, I think it's going to, especially in the resort corridor, we're going to see a lot of uh, things happening there. And then as assuming it's going to expand out from that area, um, it could very well make a big difference in our mobility, uh, you know, in those um, areas where we could be much, um, things can work a lot faster, can't they? And so we could um, see some different kinds of land uses. Um, I mean, Brady, you can jump in too. I mean, talking about the live work and the uh, all those kind of things, I think we would have more opportunities for that that might to develop from that as well. Yeah, obviously, the uh, the more access everyone has to things like the Hyperloop, the better. Um, and yeah, I mean, the further out it goes, the uh, the more interesting things become with regard to to people being able to get from one place to another and work work sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I see another one here. I said, oh, two more now. Okay, so looks like, Krishna, you had a question. How are you planning to incorporate? Oh, here we get some more. Okay, hold on. Popped up on me. Uh, let's see, where is it? Uh, okay, uh, how are you planning to incorporate safety considerations in the process? Okay, safety considerations. So, um, again, safety, that, that, that's kind of a broad category. We get into our, all our services. Um, Fire, police, and all those are considered part of our safety element. And uh, we also have another component called um, natural man-made hazards, um, which includes things like pandemics. So, I mean, all of that is, it can be covered under that. Um, it's, um, I think it's, uh, our plans need to make sure we're, we're keeping track of all that as we go. Uh, the, uh, the safety of our citizens and, and visitors is, is paramount. Uh, we can't, um, you know, we can't put people at risk in, in harm's way if, if, we, if there's any way we can mitigate some of those uh, situations. So, yeah, it's safety, that is going to be an important part of the plan. And it is, I think it's actually, uh, although six core values, it's kind of interwoven in just about all of them, is that, that need for that. So that's what I would say there. Uh, and then the next one says, uh, are we planning for... Um, Okay, AB and the CAB. Okay, uh, so um, auto autonomous vehicles. Uh, okay, so that's a great question. Um, I believe in the in that uh, core value talking about mobility. Uh, we want to uh, make sure we're covering that in there. So that's uh, that's a good point, a really good point that we don't miss that uh, opportunity in there. So that would be, I'd say, where we most likely see that. Okay. Uh, then another question, okay, a follow-up to the Hyperloop on the Hyperloop question. Uh, do we think it's going to replace the high-speed train? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, Brady, you got any thoughts on that one? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the way these things have been going lately, they, they pop up and then they go away. That's my only concern. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible. I'm not as uh, up to speed on the technology, long, long distance technology of Hyperloop. Right. Um, but it, it certainly would be, uh, be really great to have something that we could point to in this mm -hmm. country that's, that's like that. I'd say it's not one or the other. I think there's a, an opportunity for a combination of, of different approaches. So, you know, depending on the, the situation, we may have one going to, you know, one area and, you know, inter interact with the other and, you know, we could go, you could have these, uh, well, there's a station I know they want to uh, uh, go ahead and build there near um, Sunset and Warm Springs. It would be a, you know, a hub for many types of, uh, in fact, they were talking about expanding the uh, monorail down there and making that another, so believe it or not, it's still out there. <laughs> the monorail is still working. 
so we uh, we want to continue to to look at all those opportunities to be able to make a, a coordinated and uh, effective efficient transport uh, mobility system. Let's see what else. Oh, we're now we're getting more questions. Okay, so okay, next one. Uh, does master plan population projections require a water importation project or address uncertain Colorado River supply scenarios? Well. Yes, <laughs> the answer is uh, the Southern Nevada Water Authority has, has put together a lot of, or is continuing to put together a long range plan and uh, how they implement that plan. So I had some inter interaction with them on that. Uh, everything that we're seeing right now is that they can handle this as going forward, that we can get to, to where we need to go. Um, actually, I had an, uh, uh, well, I'll share this. We had a very interesting presentation uh, by Pat Mulroy, who used to be the head of the Water Authority, uh, and uh, you know we're thinking out of the box here. Okay, so bear with us. Uh, she was talking about um, having desalination that desalinization plants uh, over in the Salton Sea, bringing the water in from the Pacific, and then uh, piping it our direction. You know, as opposed to always going in the California direction. So there would be a, a kind of a shared uh, thing there. So you know, in the long term, those are those are the kind of ideas that we need to keep uh, thinking about possibly. Uh, how, how, how we can make that work in our in our future but uh, yeah we we can't just say we only have one source uh forever uh, we need to look at other options too so it, exactly okay so what else okay here's uh okay so next one as you get into codes and standards the line of sight issue where it's blocked by setbacks uh all of that's important yes uh line of sight that's been something we've uh, had for you know in our code over time, uh, we want to continue to have that. I'm sure in our um, our new development code is going to have those kind of issues addressed as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next, uh, we're talking about curb management. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. And again, talking about the autonomous vehicles. Um, okay. We'll consider doing another presentation on this going forward. So uh, yeah, this I think this would be a good one that we want want to cover. So. Thanks, uh, Cynthia, for letting us know about that. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, COVID activities. Uh, let's see, they're bringing about conversations for retrofitting already developed areas. Uh, for example, more parklets or plans to bring biking infrastructure to the strip. Hmm. Anything else related? I will tell you this, on the I'm talking about biking on the strip during COVID, uh, my wife and I had the opportunity to ride bikes down on the strip. Uh, it was Interesting, to say the least, to be able to do that. Uh, usually it's so packed down there you couldn't do that, but uh, looking for ways to make that a component of uh, what uh, is, uh, would be a great opportunity there, a great activity for people to have. Uh, how would we make that work? So yes, that's something I think we need to keep in, in mind. Uh, let's see, what else? We have another one, another question. Hopefully, I, I don't want to take cover these too quickly, uh, although we're getting down to the end. Um, if you have further follow-up we want to do, we can do that, of course, uh, via emails. Uh, so next, uh, is your plan discussing the extension of infrastructure to the planned airport to handle cargo for south of Clark County? And that means, yes, that has come up in our discussions with the, um, with the consultant as we're looking at the, uh, the plan. How do we deal with that, make that work, all the infrastructure? Uh, also, um, Department of Aviation has been working on that as well over time. And, how they can make all of those services uh, function and, and, and make sense down there for that new airport that's uh, proposed and developed, uh, will be developed at some point. Uh, any other thoughts you have, Brady, on any of these things? I kind of zipped through them quickly. <laughs> We're getting down to the end of our time here. No, not, not to me. Okay. All right. Well, um, trying to think of anything else that might. Uh, be helpful here. I think I say what I will mention one more time. Uh, make sure you're coming to our website, the transformclarkcounty.com. You can also go to the one that um, uh, Marco was mentioning, which is masterplan.vegas. So go to both, to both of those websites and uh, see what's happening up there. Um, again, City of Las Vegas, they're getting close to the end of their process. We still have a, a long a ways to go. So uh, we're looking forward to that, um, that working out for us. And and again, I've already had these conversations with Marco saying, you know, we, we do have a lot of common uh, areas of, that we can collaborate on and we want to have that opportunity whenever we can. So that's, I think, to be able to uh, make 
what we do more efficient with our jurisdictions.